Today we're going to talk about observational and experimental studies. This corresponds to section 1.3 in the Lock 5 textbook. So what are the key concepts in this section? The first key concept is the idea of an association or correlation, as well as a confounding variable, which is related to an association. The next is causation, which you should sort of think of in comparison to associations and correlations. Uh, then experiments with, the, with a variety of different things associated with it. And then finally, observational studies. We'll begin with a quick review. Uh, so this is sort of a review problem. So in 1997, in Somerset, which is a county in England, a study was conducted on lifestyle choices associated with health. A random sample of 6,009 residents of Somerset were mailed a questionnaire that they were asked to fill out, fill out and return. And 57.6% of the people in the sample returned the questionnaire. Is this a sample or a population? If it is a sample, what is a reasonable population? Is there any sampling bias? Why or why not? Okay, <clears throat> so let's first think about whether or not this is asking about a sample or a population. Well, it's usually whenever you're given a problem like this, I shouldn't say usually, always whenever you're given a problem like this, you should return back to the text. And you should look for words like sample or population or the word all, those will be clues. So in this case, we see that it says a random sample of 6,909 residents of Somerset Valley. Um, it's not Somerset Valley, Somerset. So with that in mind, we know then that this is a sample because it says a random sample right away. So if this is a sample, what might be a reasonable population to generalize to? Well, what, what might be our reasonable population? Well, it might be all of Somerset. It could be all of England. So maybe all of Somerset. Or all of England. It really depends on how representative Somerset is of all of England. But I think at a minimum, you should be able to talk about all of Somerset County and possibly all of England. So is there any evidence of sampling bias? So we know that sampling bias, you can protect yourself against sampling bias by collecting a random sample. In this situation, we did do a random sample, so there is not any sampling bias. But does that mean that there's no bias? Well, let's look here. We see that only 57.6% of the people in the sample returned their questionnaires. So we could have what's known as non-response bias, and that could certainly be an issue. Now that's not the same thing as sampling error. Remember sampling error, I mean, not error, bias. Sampling bias comes from um, not having random samples. In this situation, we have a random sample, therefore we cannot have sampling bias. But it doesn't mean that we can't have bias more generally. Hopefully this idea makes sense to you. And um, I probably should have said this before I started this, but it would have been a good opportunity for you to pause the video at that point, see if you could answer these questions before I come on, and probably thinking about that moving forward when I do these problems. So what we have here is an interesting plot. Let me make it just a hair smaller so that we can see it all in one screen. We have the year on the x-axis, and we have the uh, divorces per 1,000 people on the y-axis. And we have two lines here. We have Maine's divorce rate, which is in purple, and the U.S. margarine consumption, which is in green. And we can see in my plot here, too, that I've also labeled the right-hand side of this axis with per capita consumption of margin. In general, this is kind of actually bad data visualization um, uh, principles or practices to have two axes like this, but that's not really... Um, the important part of this figure. Looking at this figure, what do you conclude? What might you think about the relationship between the divorce rate and U.S. margarine consumption? Does Maine's divorce rate uh, track it? It certainly seems to, right? So it looks like as the divorce rate in Maine goes down, consumption of margarine also goes down, right? So we see it's really following very closely one to one. So we could say that there is an association between the divorce rate in Maine and U.S. Uh, margarine consumption. But does this figure actually tell us anything about causation? 
In other words, is this figure telling us that divorce rate is causing the margarine consumption to decrease or that the margarine consumption is causing the divorce rate in Maine to decrease? Um, if, if so, if it's the latter case, it seems like that would be an awfully good public health message to sort of get out there or maybe just a message in general to people is if you consume less margarine, you won't get divorced. However, it's not clear that that's exactly what's going on here. And if anything, it seems like we may just be having just some sort of strange association or correlation. And in fact, I should mention too that that figure comes from a website called Spurious Correlations, um, which has a lot of really fun, uh, really zany kind of correlations with things that you wouldn't expect should be associated with one another. But it really sort of leads the way into this discussion between the notion of correlation and causation. So a correlation, which we can also refer to as an association, occurs when two variables are associated slash correlated if the values of one variable tend to be related to the values of the other. So in the case of the Maine's divorce rate, um, when it went down, the divorce, uh, the margarine consumption also tended to go down. So we can say that there's a correlation. Now, a causation differs from this in the sense that two variables are causally associated if changing the value of one variable influences the value of the other. In other words, changing what we've talked about as the explanatory variable tends to cause the response variable to change. So if we want to think about the way I sort of thought about that main example the last time, that uh, consumption of margarine is driving Maine's divorce rate, then maybe in that case we might think of margarine as the explanatory variable. Is there any reason to think that if we were to go ahead and increase margarine consumption, that Maine's divorce rate would all of a sudden start going up? No, there's no reason at all. So, and similarly, if we were to change the divorce rate, we wouldn't expect that to necessarily affect or change the relationship um, uh, with margarine consumption. So that's not going to be causation at all. So <clears throat> hopefully these ideas are important. And one of the really important things that will come out of this particular lecture is that you'll understand under what circumstances we can talk about ca causation and when we're really just referring to an association and cor correlation. So I really like this graphic from XKCD uh, because I think it's it's really quite poignant. So uh, one person says, I, one student says, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't. And then the other student says, sounds like the class helped. And then the student who initially said it says, well, maybe, right? So she's inferring that the, the class caused this student to understand the difference between correlation and causation. And he's like, mm, I don't know if that's the case, right? So it's, it's kind of a cute little funny graphic. <clears throat> so I'd encourage you in your own time to kind of watch these six bizarre correlations that I linked to here, um, because it's really, it's really quite fascinating how you can end up with, I mean, what I would largely call statistical artifacts, where you just have things that just should not be related to one another but appear to be related to one another, right? And it's just, it's just um, associations, it's not causations. And this YouTube video is really fun. Um, it, has, it has six really strange correlations. <clears throat>